How dare you not like philosophy? You're just too shallow to appreciate the finer things in life. All you care about is stuff that's so basic and surface level. How dare you be so limited in your brain capacity? Don't. Why do I always have to... Uh, I really can't stand fencing types on dating websites because they're so predictable and same and they always want to do the same thing and how could they be so sh- ah! Oh my gosh, Paul, you ISTJs are so literal and logical. It just drives me crazy. I mean, can't you appreciate the deep poetry that is Lord of the Rings? What is with you guys? What? what Are we even allowed to be friends? You don't like philosophy? Do you, do you like Socrates? Ab, 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 how, about, how about Plato? Um, how about w w what does life mean? The deeper meaning of life? I don't know what to do with this guy! Alright guys, it's me again, the ISTJ. And that is just a smidgen of the amount of ISTJ shallowness that I get thrown at me from intuitive types and from the stereotypical websites. And generally people with introverted thinking fairly developed in their function stack. Being an ISTJ, we have inferior extroverted intuition, which means our bottom of the bottom function, if you go all the way down, is introverted intuition which means we typically don't like to waste time thinking about the what-ifs and the possibilities and future thinking as much as possible because the future is uncertain and we want to focus on stuff that are more likely. It's like when you go to a casino, do you really want to roll the roulette wheel when you only have a 10% chance of winning or when you have a 95% chance? Why even bother trying the 10%? That's essentially how we view life. However, this video is not to prove their point, but rather to talk about how ISTJs are not as shallow as you would think, but in more so of a different way than what you might expect. I'm not going to sit here and lie and say, hey, hey, no, 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 no. We ISTJs love Lord of the Rings, and we'll totally want to dissect what Gandalf actually means, and that the ring is a representation of temptation. No, I don't like the Lord of the Rings books. Love the movies. I do love the movies. Maybe that's the ESTP side of me talking, but I don't like the books. I find that while it's it's cool that he tried to incorporate this deeper lore and message and whatnot, it overall didn't detract from the fact that the novel was a chore to read. It just wasn't fun. Most of it was just spent wandering around and just just describing too much. Overall, ISTJs like to feel comfortable. They like to feel like things make sense. Maybe that's why we're called sensing types, because we like things to make sense. And the intuitive types don't like things to make sense. Maybe that's why they're always confusing themselves. You learn something every day when you're doing a non-scripted video. So that being said, we if we're going to go deep into something, it's more so a something something that has us thinking but not thinking so deep that we have to use any more or less than what our brain has because there's a such thing as overthinking and if you overthink too much you can get a migraine and ISTJs don't generally like feelings of sickness so to go in depth about this potential future or an alternate reality or branching possibilities it's just, it's too much on the brain. But that's not to say we don't do it at all. I know, I know. I'm babbling and I'm not getting to the point. First of all, my favorite novel is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. And there are many reasons for that. But one of the reasons why I love it so much is that on every repeat read, I learn something different about the Harry Potter universe. Or I have a new perspective on the existing Potter lore and then I start to think, okay, well, maybe this time I can think about what was going through J.K. Rowling's mind, because she's writing from the perspective of a teenage boy, and she is very clearly a woman. Or I might think, okay, well, maybe let's try reading the King's Cross chapter, not as an allegory, but let's try reading it as Harry's in a 
fog-filled room. So, as a result, Deathly Hallows gives you the room to overthink if you want to. But if you don't want to overthink, then you can take it totally at face value. And you can say, this is a fun, humorous adventure that wraps up the Harry Potter series nicely, ties into plot points from other uh, books in the series, and overall is a fitting conclusion to an adventure that we've been on for years. You could take it as, wow, it must really stink to be out in the wilderness and losing food and all that. But you could also look at the gravestones in Godric's Hollow and think about what Bible message was J.K. Rowling trying to accomplish. You could think about what did she mean by King's Cross? Like, was that supposed to be an actual occurrence that happened to Harry? Or was it more of a metaphorical what if? And actually Harry was just sleeping the whole time in the woods. The fact that the book allows me to entertain ideas, but if I don't want to entertain them, I can still enjoy it just as much, is basically proof that J.K. Rowling, while she is an intuitive type herself, gets sensing people. She gets our need for completeness and understanding and not leaving things to the imagination. Although, I guess you could argue her Twitter goes a little bit overboard with providing too much information after the series has concluded. But overall, ISTJs also like to see an end goal in mind. So, for example, while we might be willing to entertain the possibility of like, hmm, what if I chose blue lions instead of black eagles when, say, playing Fire Emblem? Because you have three different houses of students to choose from. However, that's a likely possibility. It's not an unlikely possibility. An unlikely possibility is something more along the lines of, say, if um, someone asked me, Paul, if you were born as a woman, how would your life be different? Now, I would take that question as more so of, um, hmm, oh, I can think of a few fun things that might be cool, or like, oh, yeah, yeah, that would, uh, that, that would make riding a horse way easier. But, on the other hand, I wouldn't be able to dissect all sorts of all these different moments and be up at night being like, oh, boy. I bet I will have married this husband, and I bet I will have had this much money, because that's not a likely possibility. In fact, I would even say it's an impossibility in the, the Catholic lifestyle. So why even bother speculating when it's not going to happen? But why are ISTJs like that, you might be asking. You're likely an intuitive type watching this, so you're probably saying, You ISTJs, why? Why don't you like change so much? Why don't you like thinking outside the box? Why don't you like improvising? Because there's no need for it. ISTJs, I would like to say, are very similar to what Gandalf says to Frodo near the beginning of Lord of the Rings. I didn't say I hated the whole series. I said I didn't like the books, but I do like the movies. And they kept this line in, thank goodness, where Gandalf said, a wizard is never early, Frodo Baggins. Er, other way around. A wizard is never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. That's basically how ISTJs are. Except when we're under really deep stress, then we start really overthinking things. I was actually just in sort of a meltdown ISTJ catastrophe moment and overthinking every terrible thing that ever happened to me, what could happen, and how I could be a disaster to the family. But normally, we don't like doing that, because that wastes a lot of energy, and ISTJs like to conserve their energy. So, we don't like to be doing things that are going to make us tired and worn out and scratching our head a whole lot. We're going to try to go for optimal health. So, if I have to think about something too hard, then my brain's going to be working really hard to make sense of all of that. And if the brain is working too hard, then blood's going to be sent to the head. And that's going to hurt. Kind of like if you're upside down in the monkey bars for too long. The blood rushes to your head and you're like, Ow! I don't want to do that. I don't need to do that. God oriented me so that my feet are stuck to the center of gravity. And my head is pointing in the opposite direction. 
if we ever do like to get into things deep, it's if we like to speculate possible possibilities, like likely possibilities. So for example, a lot of ISTJs are really good at chess. We like chess because it has a very defined rule set. Basically, the, the pieces always move in the same pattern based on predetermined parameters. So as a result, there's many different ways in which chess could go, and there's many different ways our opponent could go. So we try to read, okay, what would our opponent do in this situation based on the available moveset that they already have so that I will know based on my moveset how to counter that. So we're able to envision all of the possibilities because we already know all of the possibilities because we already know the rules. I'm not actually a grandmaster at chess, but at least I know all of the basic tips and tricks. And I taught my brother how to play and he's basically a grandmaster. So I guess I'm a grandmaster teacher type apprentice thing. I also really love Fire Emblem because I know the ranges in my units. I know what weapons they have. There's a combat forecast, and overall, it gives you percentages. Dominant intuitive types, especially the introverted ones, tend to go for the far-reaching possibilities that are a little bit harder to think about. And while I wouldn't necessarily say I hate what they think about, it's the way it's presented that makes it unapproachable to an ISTJ. Now, if, say... Let me give you the optimal way that someone would get me into Harry Potter if I wasn't already a fan. If someone said, so Paul, um, I hear that you really like adventures. Oh yeah, heck yeah, I like adventures. I used to love the junior adventure games on the PC, you know, with Pajama Sam and Spy Fox and Freddy Fish. Those are always so much fun. Well, what, what if I told you that there's a book that's a true adventure and they have to do detective work. Detective work, huh? What kind of detective work are we talking about here? They have to find these seven objects and they're given hardly any information. So they have to go with what they already know from previous entries of the books. Hmm. Well, what exactly are the previous books like? Well, for starters, there's a lot of humor. Clean humor, I hope? Mostly. Okay, well, um, what's the setting? Well, it's within a giant castle that is so much fun to explore that Harry gets a map of the place that shows how everyone is moving. A map that shows everyone moving? Intriguing. Oh, and there's moving staircases, and the books even say how many staircases there are. Ooh. Moving staircases. And the book tells you how many, so you can get an approximate view of what the environment is like. But it doesn't tell you everything. Now, that's kind of a stretch because I've... The way I got into Harry Potter wasn't actually like that at all. It was actually just my brother was watching it. And I thought that some of the lines of dialogue I was hearing were really funny. Because it was at the part where the Dursleys were angry at Harry. And I thought the Dursleys were just so ridiculous. So I got hooked into watching it, and then I ended up watching the first two movies back to back, and I loved them. And then after watching the first four, then I got into the books, and I loved the books even more. So it was more so of just, I saw something that looked appealing, and I went for it. See, if the ISTJ can't see the appeal with their senses, they're not going to want to do it. So if you want an ISTJ to not be shallow, you have to present it in a way that's going to be sensual. You can feel it. You can touch it. So that's not to say ISTJs won't be deep. It's more so of you're going too deep for them. For instance, one of the things I really love talking about that's in the total realm of speculation is the Garden of Eden. But the Garden of Eden was meant to be in the category of books known as mythological meaning not necessarily 100% factual. I mean, the existence of dinosaur fossils should probably tell you the world wasn't created in only seven literal days. But when I think about what could have happened in the Garden of Eden, I think about what they, that could mean to us. Like, okay, so if 
man fell by just eating fruit. That seems kind of weird because at the Last Supper, Jesus had them drink wine, which was actually his blood. So why would he use a fruit? Well, it may not have actually been a literal fruit. It was more so the fact that they disobeyed God and that disobedience has consequences. So how could they have disobeyed God? And then we start to think about theology and we say, okay, well, based on what I know about theology, and based on what we know about original sin, then it's a likely hypothesis that this is what they were tempted by. Now, I don't want to talk too much into that because I can go on and on about Eden, but suffice to say that that's the kind of thing where I know my limits. I know how far I can take the concept before it becomes too much thinking. I know, okay, well, I know that Adam and Eve were naked without shame, so therefore the sin wasn't necessarily vanity, or the sin couldn't have necessarily been of an, a, a jealous nature or anything like that. So, so see right there, the naked without shame, just three words give me bases for the speculation. However, if you're just going on this wild open field of unknown, that's where I'm going to draw the line and say, now hold on a minute. That's just way too much that we don't know. So for example, if someone says to me, uh, Paul, where do you imagine yourself being 20 years from now? I'd be like, um, I don't know. I can't even imagine what my life's going to be like three months from now. Because so many things could happen that we cannot predict. But because we cannot predict them, we don't want to waste time thinking about them. Because if we did that, life would be really, really, really hard. For instance, if I woke up the next morning and I said, it is very likely that a fire could break out of my house and I'm going to lose every single one of my possessions. So now I have to think about a crisis plan so that I can go to the latest homeless shelter. And then I have to figure out how I'm going to survive there and what I'm going to do with my current job. And figuring all that stuff out is a hassle because I could go the next 40 years of my life and my house could never burn down. It could, yes, but that's spending way too much time worrying when you can just enjoy what you have. If people didn't appreciate what they have in the moment, it's like, how are you ever going to appreciate what you have? So, okay, let me give you another rhetorical example. Let's say an INTJ is thinking about what kind of life they envision in the future. Well, then what are they going to envision in the future of the future? See, eventually there has to come to a point where you stop planning and you start enjoying the moment. For ISTJs, that moment is right here, right now. Sure, we may think a couple of months in advance, and we like deadlines, but that's because if we're put into an unfamiliar situation, we need to know the bases of which we can work. So if I'm going to this brand new social outing, I don't know how that could turn out. For all I know, the person could be overly sensitive, and if I say the word cake, then, I don't know, that may remind them of the origin of the wedding cake, which is not something I want to mention on this channel because it's very R-rated. But there are people like that who could get triggered by the slightest little thing. And because I don't know the person, how am I supposed to know that that's going to happen? So by giving a rough outline, then the ISTJ can plan ahead and say, okay, well, let's make sure that everything is comfortable and moving smoothly because of a pre-existing logic system. That's why ISTJs like logic. Because logic, well, logic is kind of a harsh word because that seems more like what the ESTJs and the ENTJs would do. I would say practicality is more so what ISTJs like. We like things that are reasonable and realistic. See, you can't use logic all the time because that's just not going to happen. Some people are not logically oriented and we just have to accept that. However, we do also accept that every human person has a conscience. So it's more realistic to think were they thinking by their conscience. But on the other hand, 
because we're aware in the moment, we're going to think deeply about how to solve the present crisis, which means that oftentimes we have surprisingly simple solutions that the intuitive types are like, why didn't I think about that? And it's like, because you're too busy thinking about alternate possibilities that don't have a likely chance. You're too busy being in the 0% range over the 99% range. Because ISTJs have this existing system in place, we don't feel the need to over-speculate and panic. Now, the times when we do panic are when we don't have any information to work with. So if, for example, an ISTJ has never been to school in their life, but they're shown to be a child prodigy, and so they get accepted into college, they're going to freak out because they've never been in that type of environment. They don't know what to expect from a classroom. They don't know what to expect from the books. They don't know what to expect from anything. And so there's that complete lack of a known system to fall back on. However, ISTJs are not nearly as hard-nosed rule fall. Uh, well, rule. I can't say that. I meant to say hard-nosed structure followers, as you would think. You see, our dominant function is introverted sensing. So therefore, that means we're going to go by what we know. And if what we know is something that's more spontaneous, then we can account for that. So sometimes that means that to a certain extent, we'll allow ourselves to engage in speculation. However, for all the intuitive types watching this saying, gee, Paul, you make it sound like it's so easy to talk to ISTJs. What's the secret? The secret is presenting things straight to you. You know, if you're announcing the, the date when a video game's going to come out, you're not going to say, by the time the moon has cycled around the world three times, at which the eagle's cry goes past the tree, you're going to say, June 19th. It's so simple. It, just say it like that. You don't need to go around in circles and weird tangled metaphors to just talk to, about everything. Just present it as it is. So, for example... If you want me to get deeper into Lord of the Rings, provide a compelling reason for why the books are an entertaining read, why it might be fun to read them, why it would be worth investing my time in something that is so dull and slow. Like, for example, if someone said, Hey, Paul, here's an alternate fan fiction where there's not as much wandering and more people die. Then I would say, oh, now you've got me intrigued because dying is more realistic in a war. And the fact that so many people survived, especially hobbits walking in bare feet at a volcano, how the heck did their feet not burn to death? Basically, if they got rid of that suspension of disbelief, that constant questioning of this doesn't fit, that ISTJs are always having, that would make it more enjoyable. Some of you might think I'm going in circles with this. Honestly, I kind of think I am too. You know what they say, inside every ISTJ is an ENFP. But I hope I got you to realize that we... It's not like we dislike being deep. Heck, a couple of years ago, I would have said, I, I love being deep. I hate shallowness. But it's more so if I don't like dumbing things down as opposed to not liking deep things. Because I could talk about theology... For quite a while, I could be like, okay, let's talk Trinitarian theology. Let's talk Eucharistic theology. That's based on parameters that I already know that are set by the catechism. However, if you get into subjects like, uh, what's the point of existence? It's like, well, how far can I take that? I mean, wh why are we even speculating that? Is it even possible to find an answer? And if the answer is no, then we're not going to waste time on something impossible. It's like... If someone asked me, hey, Paul, you want to go to California? I'll be like, how long is it going to take? Oh, we can get there in two minutes. I'd be like, that's impossible. I live in the Midwest of the U.S., and it's not going to take two minutes. But, but, Paul, we have to. This is a grand adventure. We have to broaden our horizons. No, it is physically impossible to travel from mid-U.S. to California to California in two minutes. You don't have the resources. You don't have fast enough machinery 
you haven't invented a teleporter that can make that possible. So why am I even bothering with this conversation? It's ridiculous. It's completely pointless. So make it something that's engaging, realistic, and possible. Then you'll see a side of the ISTJ that you never saw come out. Some ISTJs can make for incredibly talented writers or authors because they draw on past experiences and present it basically as it were. They don't need to go into this bubbly, weird z rainbows and unicorns world because unicorns don't exist. They go into the world of grass and fields and trees and dandelions because those are things that exist. They're realistic. They're tangible. And even if something doesn't exist, like say in the Harry Potter series, um, wands, J.K. Rowling describes the wood used to make the wand. And then she describes what's inside the wand. So the ISTJ can immediately say, ah, Hawthorne. Okay, I know what Hawthorne wood looks like. And then she describes the length of each wand. Then she'll say, like, this has a phoenix feather in it. So we can be like, well, okay. So a phoenix is a mythical bird of legend, and it has this kind of feather. And then she describes characters with a lot of exaggerated proportions, so that way we can properly envision what we're supposed to be reading. Basically, just go read a Harry Potter book. <laughs> if you really want to know how to entertain an ISTJ, just go read a Harry Potter book and pay particular attention to how J.K. Rowling describes people and how she describes concepts in the wizarding world. Like, how does she describe the Hogwarts houses? How does she describe the sorting hat? How does she describe Harry's glasses? You know, even something as simple as that. She doesn't go into too much detail, but she does go into too little. She gives us exactly enough to work with, with what our brains are capable of. This went way longer than I intended, but hopefully it was informative enough that the length was worth it. So let me know in the comments section down below if there's anything I missed whatsoever. If you still think ISTJs are shallow, if you could explain further what you mean by that, or if you're an ISTJ and you're like, yo, Paul, keep representing us, I'll do my best. And then give me a suggestion for another ISTJ info dumping episode. I love doing these and it's fun to show the world how underappreciated and super rare we are. How I wish more people would take into account what we are like. But alas, INFJ imitation is for another day. For now, keep the faith, stay epic, God bless, and do things that are possible, not impossible. Bye-bye.